Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Monsignor Ron Jameson. I'm the rector here at St. Matthew's, and I've only been here for about 24 years as rector, but it's always great to be able to welcome so many people to this room. This room is used for so many different things, and so we're just so delighted to have all of you here, and certainly to Bishop Dorsonville, welcome. Glad to have you. He's learned his way around St. Matthew's pretty well over the years, too, so we're happy to have him. And uh, also, I can't neglect to, you know, with John Carr back there. John, welcome. Uh, John and I go back a few years, just a few, you know, because we're both still young, John. Children. Right? Children, yes, right. <laughs> Believe that one. And uh, anyway, uh, we used to work together with Cardinal Hickey, and so it's, he's always been a great friend, and if John says he wants this room or he wants to come here, he knows all he has to do is ask, and he has it, you know. And then through John, I met Kim. Welcome. Glad to have all of you here this evening. And um, just, you know, for a moment, you know, St. Matthew's. St. Matthew's is a great place. It means so much to me. You know, after 24 years plus 11 years before that, being here, this is home to me. So I am just so delighted to have you come to my home. And not just for this evening, but you can come anytime. We have a beautiful cathedral uh, just restored 15 years ago. And uh, we would love to have you to come to celebrate Eucharist with us and also just to come at any time. And I will offer you a special deal. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyone, you know, you, members of your family, your friends who would like to have a little tour of the cathedral at any time, uh, just let me know, and I'll be happy to, ta to have Father Lopez give you the tour. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, I'd be very happy to do that, and we're just happy to have you. So tonight is a great, just really a privilege to have all of you here. We hope to see you back, not just maybe at a meeting like this, but also, you know, next door at the cathedral, and it's a really a great honor. And uh, for me, it's a great privilege to welcome all of you, because you are so important because you are the young Latino leaders. And we have a Spanish mass every Sunday, one o'clock. Come on to that as well. And, um, but um, your role in the society today is so very important. So um, thank you very much for being here. I'm certainly glad to have you. And um, Kim, I didn't talk 15 minutes, so now we'll give you back to the, for the program this evening. God bless you. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And I'll say a few words about our program here. We're so excited to have you here. This is really a moment for renewing our Latino Leaders Program at the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown, along with the Archdiocese of Washington. Um, our partnership with the Archdiocese of Washington is really important to us. And I want to, I'm sitting up here tonight, and you're probably asking yourselves, she's not Latina, and she's not young, so why is she up there? Uh, but I'm new in my position as Associate Director, and I wanted to really get here tonight just to be able to say to you all how important this program is to us and to the archdiocese. Um, I wanted to be involved here so that we could we could say our, we really our goal is to get advice from you all. We're going to be looking for people to be part of our leadership group, and we're really excited about our program here tonight. But before we talk more about that, I want to introduce Bishop Mario Dorsonville from the archdiocese. He's going to say a few words about Archbishop Romero uh, and about uh, about our, the canonization that's happening this weekend. So thank you, Bishop. Dorsen. <laughs> That, that, that's the echo of Encuentro. We, we just <laughs> had such a great time at, uh, in Texas uh, two weeks ago, and uh, it was very rewarding. I might be able to talk to, to about it uh, to all of you. However, uh, John, Kim, thank you. Thank you so much for this kind invitation. 
so important. Wherever I go, there is so much center in the Latino initiatives and uh, is reflected in Georgetown University, begins to be reflected in so many uh, centers of formation in Washington and across the country as well, but also is ref reflected in such a great and powerful way in the Archdiocese of Washington. And I am so happy and pleased to let you know that Latinos in the Archdiocese are a real priority and uh, I wouldn't be able to begin the conversation without recognizing three years of uh, such a wonderful work of Javier that I... <laughs> I am very, very excited about his great news for himself, sad for us, but he is transferring from the Archdiocese now to Catholic University. We wish you the best, the best work there, and I'm sure you will be able to do a great job. Thank you, Javier, for your three years of working with young Latinos and multicultural uh, spectrum in the Archdiocese of Washington. And saying that, let us go into the reflection of someone that deserves so much attention, especially during these days when his canonization is approaching faster, and this Sunday, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, is going to canonize uh, Archbishop uh, Oscar Romero from El Salvador. Uh, a good uh, priest of the Archdiocese, he told me, uh, Rome now looks like Salvadorian, because there are so many Salvadorians in Rome at this moment <laughs> that everything is about pupusas. But... <laughs> But, but I'm sure that is the energy, the testimony of a man who began by cultivating something that is extremely important and connatural to the Christian life, which was being a faithful friend. Friendship was so important for this man that uh, he grew up in that context of interrelating with his priests, seminarians, fellows, and uh, he really was the man who centered vision and enjoyed the, the achievements of others, and that was the case of his very close friend, Father uh, Rutilio Grande, who was a Jesuit, and a very close friend of Archbishop Romero. And uh, he just began to realize and admire this man because of the sensibility that he, that he had. Remember, this is post-Vatican II and is in the blood of all these priests gathering at the space. Watch for the signs of the times. Look. Yes, evan evangelization is a priority, but Paul VI, who is going to be canonized as well with Archbishop Romero, was uh, exhorting very clearly how important it was to inculturate the gospel of Jesus Christ in the life of the people. Then it was a real rhythm in their minds. Yes, we're going to proclaim the good news of the gospel. We're going to proclaim justice, love, but we have to see how these people are experiencing these kind of points in their lives. And uh, of course, Rutilio eh, Grande began with these communities, faith communities, based faith communities, and he began to cultivate the spectrum of getting deeper in the analysis of the social conditions that these people were living to avoid the gospel be an alienation in their lives, but, but also it would be more or less like the path for them to find the sense of justice and freedom that every single human being is entitled to. And uh, when the voice of the prophet goes stronger, well, it seems that that is when the bombs begin to appear 
on the road. And for Father Grande, it was the first martyr or the first mother, uh, murder priest that happened in El, Sal in El Salvador in the years 1977, I think that he was killed and uh, murdered. And that was a very dramatic point in the life of Archbishop Romero to see that his best friend was killed, murdered, and that he left a lot of orphans, members of the church, without a leader. Right there seems, from what I have heard from some members of the Episcopal Conference in El Salvador, it was like the light and the call for Archbishop Romero to say, my friend is dead, but Christ is not. And the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to continue to be proclaimed. And that is when he embraced with so much love, and seems that it is like a transformation in the life of this man, who was kind of, yeah, but not passive, but gentle, low profile, and he begins to walk and to work and to get involved with the poorest of the poor in El Salvador. And he just began to see injustice and crime and war. And of course, as an Archbishop of Salvador, think about it, he had to celebrate 10 funerals of his priests. Therefore, that was a devastating time for him. And uh, even though it was a very painful trajectory that this man had to go through being misunderstood, sometimes being accused, sometimes being kind of ignored and put apart and segre segregated and confused by something that was never true, saying this is a left, a left uh, oriented bishop and was not was so faithful to the magisterium of the church, was so faithful to Pope Paul VI, was so faithful to the church and to Jesus Christ. And uh, in that dynamics is when he began to preach and preach love, reconciliation, and respect of the human person and the human life. And of course, in a civil war, that words are not welcome. And if you have ever heard his last homily, he just, uh, in such a profound way, comes and asks the people who are killing and says, I beg you, I order you, stop this killing. You don't kill your brothers. You don't kill your sisters. And that was kind of the most important message that he, he, he could pronounce just trying to promote the respect of the human person and the solidification of peace in around El Salvador. He did it, I guess, in so many, in so many ways, after so many years, the, the way that the, the church, the country, and not only El Salvador, but across the Latin American region, we see this martyr, it is a powerful sign of commitment to the church, to his priestly life, and to the community and the, the people that he, he served and he loved. And moments that uh, we hear such a difficult news in our church, it is so refreshing uh, brothers and sisters, to see that the church also has produced such a great and holy men that they are here in our country, in our church, in the archdiocese. I, I just want to commend the kindness and the, 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 the pastoral approach that Monsignor Jameson had at the beginning 50 years as a priest, and it's such a great testimony of a life dedicated to serve those who come to 
to the cathedral and those who have been members of this particular church. That is what we have to be moved and to see and to understand that the canonization of a person comes not only because they were very close to Jesus Christ, but because they were able to discover the face of Jesus Christ and the people that they were entrusted to. And uh, in the case of Archb Archbishop Romero, he did it until the end of his life. For you to, to measure the way that he moved the last days that he knew in some ways that someone could attend against his life, he preferred to drive by himself. He didn't want to risk anyone around himself to be killed because sometimes they say, well, if they're going to kill, they will kill everyone who is around himself. The fact that he was killed or murdered in the celebration of the, uh, of the, Holy, uh, the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist means so much for the blood of the martyr. He was a martyr because he decided to announce the good news of the church, the good news of Jesus Christ to those who really need it at this moment. And because of this, they took away his life, but not his legacy and not his words because they were not his words, but Jesus Christ's words. And that is something very important. Wherever you might be in crisis, wherever it might be you disappointed, wherever you might be saying, well, so many news, just go to the Blessed Sacrament and ask Jesus Christ, when you have betrayed me, when you have been, uh, or when have you left me by myself, you have been the faithful, always here for me. And that is why the big connection of the life of this bishop that uh, saw in such a powerful way a responsibility to go ahead even against the, the same institution to proclaim that it's important to love, to forgive, and to proportionate to new generations the real sense of peace. But as Paul VI used to say, if you really want peace, work for justice. And it was Paul VI, wasn't Archbishop Romero. And it wasn't Paul VI, it's Jesus Christ, the one who says that. Therefore, I really think the, the, the introduction for an eyewitness and someone who has much knowledge about his life it is not only we came here to learn about the saint, we came here to fall in love with the call of being saints. Therefore, this is not only for one person in El Salvador. Being saint is for each of us every day when we say, yes, Lord, make me your instrument. Make me with my words and my presence to love, to serve and to really go directly how to promote the sense of human respect for the human person. In an environment where we see so many immigrants in such a difficult circumstances, let us ask ourselves one question. If Archbishop Romero were in the United States, in Washington, what would be his message? with this terrible, broken system of immigration that we have. I really think that this recapitulating the past to put it in the present, that's why we say always, Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Portugal, for those remarks. That was very thoughtful, and, and what a great way to open this program. Once again, my name is Kim Daniels. I'm the Associate Director of the Initiative on Catholic, Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University. 
Uh, we have several different programs. We run public dialogues, um, some of which are in Dahlgren Chapel, some of which are prayerful and reflective, and others are big public dialogues. We have a second program called the Salt and Light Program, aimed at young professionals, Catholics here in DC, which are all welcome to, of course, and we, we really hope you're at those events as well. And our third program, which I'm very excited to be helping to renew this year, is our Latino Leaders Program. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but right now I wanna say I can't think of any better patron for our Latino Leaders Program than Archbishop Romero. Um, to me, his example of courageous witness, his example of faith in, the, in a challenging time, and we're facing such challenging times in our church as well, that that's what we're looking for here too. Uh, we have a great panel here tonight to talk more and to learn a little bit more about Archbishop, Archbishop Romero's life and work. And I wanna introduce you first of all to da Honorable David Bonnier to my left. Um, uh, David was a representative from Michigan for many years, was a Democratic whip in Congress, um, and was very involved in these issues, uh, has worked for justice and peace in Central America, and um, in particular on these issues in El Salvador. So we're very excited to have him here to talk with us a little bit about his experience. Secondly, we have Anna Pena, who is the general consul for the El Salvadoran consulate. Um, she lived in El Salvador as a child during this time, and I was just so excited to learn that she's had, uh, she was at Archbishop Romero's funeral as a young child and has so much to add on this too. So really looking forward to getting into this discussion. Our third panelist, Marcelo Perdomo, is on his way, and we hope he makes it here. And, uh, but he has much to add as well. He was a sacristan for Archbishop Romero. Um, so in any event, David, let's start with you as we get mm -hmm. going. Um, you were a leader in the House of Representatives on human rights in El Salvador um, during this period. Can you set the context for us? What was it like at the time? How did it feel in the United States to talk about these issues? Um, what did people think at the time? And how did Archbishop Romero inspire your work then? Thank you. Thank you for, sure. for having me. And it's wonderful to see such a good sized crowd here this evening to uh, and I want to first of all uh, uh, thank you for welcoming us to your home, Monsignor, and for your really wonderful and wise words, Bishop. Uh, very moving. Uh, so what was it like in the 1980s? Uh, well, Central America was quite a different place. Uh, it was racked with war. 300,000 people lost their lives in Central America during this period of time in Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras. Uh, it was quite a difficult battle in the Congress to stop war money from going to support these wars. Uh, the president at that time was Ronald Reagan for most of that period, and he saw this in a prism of Cold War, uh, communism versus the rest of the world, and these were proxy wars for him. They were really CIA wars in which we funneled enormous amounts of money. In Salvador, huge numbers, billions of dollars to the existing government to do what they did, and what they did was quite unconscionable. Over 75,000 killed during that 12-year period from 80 to 92, and in the most heinous ways. It was quite a, a brutal situation and the fact that they would go after Oscar Romero uh, it, at mass uh, is indicative of the brutality uh, that was there. Uh, so we, this was actually the number one foreign policy issue in the United States Congress at that time. You might think, well, there were other things, weren't there? There was East-West problems, there was the Cold War, but no, the, the, the most activity around what was going on in the world and the Congress centered around ending the wars in Central America. And through a series of proposals that were offered, uh, uh, culminating with the election of Oscar Arias in Costa Rica, uh, who ran on a peace platform, then he put together a Central America peace platform that was adopted in Escapulas, Guatemala, and uh, brought here, and we had really difficult time, but we finally got it accepted here, and then slowly one country out of the, uh, after another, uh, with the election in 90 in Nicaragua, with uh, after the murders at the uh, UNCA in El Salvador, where Father Yulacria and uh, I think six priests and a nun and her 
uh, excuse me, her, her housekeeper and her daughter were killed. That kind of gave the real impetus to close down that terrible war. And then in Guatemala, it, just next door, it was horrendous. Over 250,000, mostly indigenous people, were killed, were murdered by the government over a period of 30 years. But nonetheless, it was just absolutely horrific. And that got shut down shortly thereafter as well. But what have we left? We left the history of violence. And of course, that violence was felt by the four religious women who uh, came to El Salvador to do good work and were murdered in 1980. The murder, of course, of uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero and, uh, and many other uh, terrible things that occurred. I, I want to just, if I could, take one second to read one little piece. Uh, this is the shepherd's diary. It's his diary. And it's, uh, oh, he, he, he was archbishop for three years. And this is his last two years. And it's a diary of everything that, you know, that was important to him that day. What he did during that day, the political problems he faced that day, within his own, with, the, with often with his own bishops. You know, there were like six bishops, I think, down, down in El Salvador. And he often was opposed by four of them. And so he had that own, he had that internal struggle that he had to deal with within his own church. Uh, so this talks about his feelings about this and his religious feelings and his personal feelings. And I really highly recommend it to you. Uh, I was there in 2010 for the 30th anniversary of his assassination. And we had this long procession that we marched to the cathedral and we all had, it was in the evening and we had, had candles and the candles were dripping on our skin, but nobody would dare yell out given the terrible nature of what had happened in El Salvador over those, over those years. And it was quite a moving display of, of support. He was a very smart political guy. He could figure out like, you know, he, he, he called a strike for the schools, put the kids out of schools for three days. And then in addition to that, he, dis, he suspended all masses in El Salvador except for one, and that was at the cathedral. And, uh, and the power of that was, was quite amazing because the people came. The people came, and it sent a message to those who were in power. Uh, those who were in power were very much concerned about him because he spoke truth to power. He was not afraid. I think if there's one piece that I would say that makes him stand out was his was his courage. He was willing to take on the existing government. And, uh, and I think his, the death of his friend, Father Grande, was helped move him almost totally in that direction. And I'd like to just kind of quote, shortly before his assassination, Archbishop Romero said, I do not believe in death without resurrection. If they kill me, I shall rise in the Salvadoran people. If the threats come to be fulfilled from this moment, I offer my blood to God for the redemption and the resurrection of El Salvador. Martyrdom is a grace of God that I do not believe I deserve. But if God accepts the sacrifice of my life, let my blood be a seed of freedom and the sign that hope will soon be a reality. Let my death, if it is accepted by God, be for the liberation of my people. So if there is a reason to get involved here in the United States, I say this now to the young Latino, and Latino leaders that are here, that is a good reason. Uh, what he did for people in poverty, what he did for people who were looking for a, a better life, uh, what he did for his church, he gave up his life for it. And it made a difference. It took a while to end the wars, but it, we ended them. And people like myself in the Congress, and I will end with this, uh, who were working on ending these wars with the Washington Office on Latin America, and we had a huge caucus of, we had 200 and, I think at that time, 50 Democrats in the House. And I would say we had a caucus of about 120. 120, half of them at that time, were engaged in stopping the wars in Central America, in El Salvador, Nicaragua, 
in Guatemala particularly. So it was because of people like him who, who set the example. He set the example like Mandela set the example in South Africa, like uh, Gandhi set it in India, like Mother Teresa set it in Bangladesh. And that, that's why this canonization, I think, is so terribly, terribly important because it, 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 it shows what working through Christ and the church we can actually accomplish even though the path and the road may be difficult. In the end, we can actually get something done. And the question now is how do we keep it and how do we bring peace and justice uh, to these areas that have suffered so much for so long? I think it's so, that places our conversation in such a great place because I think that what, what I hear you saying is first of all, that faithful witness is so important that we shouldn't get discouraged when times are tough, that we all face challenging times in our lives or in the period of history that we live in and that those challenges are something that with courage, with faith, we can rise above and we look to saints like, like Archbishop Romero. And at, what was he like as a, as a sort of a model for you as a young person, as a young child? What was it like to be in El Salvador at that time even though you were a very little child? And how has that inspired your faith and your work? Yeah, well, um, I was I I born and, and grew in El Salvador, and when when the funeral occurs, uh, I was seven, but I really remember every single detail of that day. Um, well, I didn't say thank you today because I'm so excited. Um, thank you, Monsignor, for having me. Thank you uh, for for inviting. As, uh, for inviting me and thank you for sharing this this conversation. Well, uh, as I was saying, I was seven, but I remember every single detail. I have some notes, otherwise I have to struggle too much to speak in English. Well, and and I, I remember my grandma saying to my mom, uh, please don't go to the funeral because they're going, something going to happen, don't go. And in Spanish it's, um, van a reprimir esa misa. They're going to kill people there. Please don't go. So my, my mom didn't hear, and we went. Uh, we went to come, in, come close to the coffin, but we couldn't get it. So we stay at the east, um, at the east son of the cathedral. And I remember a crowd of people there uh, with uh, photos like this one, or, or um, uh, umbrellas and and pañuelos. I don't, say, I don't know how to say. It. And um, and then as the the bombs start. The shoot the shoot gun starts. So we were uh, next to the radio JSAX, and this is the radio that broadcast the mass every single Sunday. And I remember my mom hearing the mass through the through the radio. And if you walk into the village, you can, you can hear the voice of Monsignor Romero on the radio because everybody, well, who has electricity and has a radio could, could hear it. Um, and I, when we spend um, many hours over there in the radio station, I, I remember my mom with only one shoe because everybody lost their shoes. And there is a, a symbol of the shoes in El Salvador. They commemorate with a peel of shoes in the Central Park, remembering all the people that lose their shoes, but not only the shoes, because there were murders over there, like 40. And I think that was the time that I learned that I was living in a war. And there are bad, bad people and good people. And the bad people were the ones who killed Monsignor Romero. But it was like a very simple, easiest me, me, way to understand a war, bad and good. But there is a more thing happening over there, but I was just seven. Um, so was, well, I, I grew up as a, in a religion, Christian groups. Romero was always present. I study at the uh, Jesuit University. Uh, we used to listen the homilies um, 
on tapes, mm -hmm. and then we reflect about the homilies. And um, of course, it impacted my life. Uh, we have a, my mom has a, a picture of Monsignor Romero in every single room of, of my house, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I also have it in my office. So um, the imagine of Monsignor Romero says to me justice through dignity, human dignity that we were lost during the war. And seek, seek the justice in this war, in this moment, with these immigrant, immigration laws here, is uh, really hard uh, to do. And in my position, that is a very diplomatic um, uh, way to be, is uh, more difficult. So I think in my work, that's what, what I'm always do, like um, monitoring the due process on the detention centers. This is the law. So I have to, to see if it's doing okay. Um, visiting the shelters where the Nana Company children are, uh, bringing them peace or hope or um, a war of a war of hope. That's that's the that's the way I say it. Um, is the is the thing that I that I do in, in in every in every day of my of my work of my job. So. Um, I think uh, this is a paraphrase of, that inspired me. It's uh, a religion of Sunday Mass, but on fair weeks does not like the Lord. A religion of much prayer, but with hypocrisy in the heart is not Christian. A church that settles only to be well, to have a lot of money or a lot of comfort, but to forget to claim of injustice will not be the true church. Yes, that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. And thank you. That was that was so beautiful, Ina. Thank you. And I feel two things stood out from your comments mm -hmm. for me. Many things stood out, but two in particular. And the first was this image of people listening to the radio, right? That there's not a lot of media sources. There's not a lot where you can go to get to hear about what's going on. So people gathered around and listening to the radio people looking at images in every room in the house. And I'm one of those people too. I put <laughs> images everywhere of my favorite scenes and people who inspire me. And at the same time, today, when we think about young people today, I think what we see is there's so much coming at us, right? So many images, so many voices that it's hard to hone in on what's the truth, what's going to help us live that courageous witness. I'm wondering if you see Pope Francis, when we look at Pope Francis being the Pope who is canonizing Archbishop mm -hmm. Romero, do you see a comparison between his use of images and his focus on the poor and the marginalized and the repressed um, as, as a, uh, another example of trying to break through that noise? Um, and how do you see the connection there? How do you see the connection between that? And what does this canonization mean for you that Archbishop Romero is finally becoming a saint? Well, it's we start a, with you? Oh, okay. Yeah, you go it's ahead, a, thank you. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> well, it's a huge happy, happy, it's happy for me in my heart is uh, to be, to have the, to have the very first saint in our country and, and see that is Monsignor Romero and, and, um, and, and I think this is the, the hope that our country needs to keep working, to keep working on our country, is important to share the thought that Monsignor Romero has. He he has a big dreams and and it, and he put it on the on their uh, words and and he think that we can be united, that we can be together, we can, um, I mean, gather in in peace in a peace country, but. But it's, it's hard, it's like, a, I think it's like a romantic, a, a little romantic, I think. And, but it's a, the utopia that we have to seek. And um, I think impacts to El Salvador a lot because we already changed the name of many things like uh, 
the, we have a Boulevard Monseñor Romero, we have the International Airport of Monseñor Romero, and people, and people say, why don't we change the name so we can, we can have a Monseñor Romero country, not El Salvador, but we have a very, very, very beautiful name. El Salvador is a good one. And um, when, yeah, we have to, we have to convince the uh, people to, to hear Monseñor Romero uh, lessons. Uh, I think we're doing a very good job. My daughter, um, she studied in, at high school, Monseñor Romero. She has activities uh, with, um, well, she has, she studied in a Catholic school, so, but, but in El Salvador, but I think it's in the curricula right now. Uh, they are studying in the history of El Salvador, and one important thing is Monseñor Romero and their lessons. So I think uh, uh, this is uh, going to give, give the, the country more power to, to spread the, the image of Monseñor Romero and their lesson and their mm -hmm. culture. So as uh, Archivist Darsonville says, um, Sal Monseñor Romero is a Salvatorian. Am I a Salvatorian? Yes, I am. Um, uh, I, live, I live in El Salvador and I grew up in El Salvador and he, he did too. And he saw the injustice and I saw the injustice. So can we be like him? Because he was a human being like us yeah. and we saw him. So we can be saints too. And that's, that's so wonderful to me, the idea of, of seeing injustice and acting on that, which is what he did, just like you said. David, you had decades of public service when you worked on these very challenging issues despite a lot of opposition. If you're, you're speaking here to a group of, of young Latino leaders, young Latina leaders, what would you say to them right now? What kind of injustices do we see now? How would you use Archbishop Romero's example to take lessons for how they can act today? Well. Let me just ask, I'll answer that, but let me just go back to your first question, Great. because I think there's a, quite a bit of similarity between Francis and, and Archbishop yes. Romero. Uh, they both evolved in their personalities and kept working at it throughout their whole lives. They were both taken in their ministry by their activities and work with the poor. Uh, Francis in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, going to the poor neighborhoods, even in Rome now as Pope. He goes and speaks and talks to uh, the working class in the poor neighborhoods and, and the folks there. And, and of course, Arch, uh, Archbishop Romero, when he was, uh, was a pastor for 20 some years, and I guess he had this one in the Santiago de Maria, a uh, very poor place. That's where he got his sense in, of working for people that don't have anything and uh, in terms of uh, economics. And, he was in, got interested in land reform and got interested in workers' rights, the labor situation of, of, of children and their, and their parents. So they, they, they have a lot both in, in common. I would say to your second question, uh, by the way, the, 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 uh, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, radio because, yeah. because one of the things that I have read is Archbishop Romero not only on Sunday would his homily would be heard, and that was a great description, mm -hmm. as you said, if you walked down the, mm -hmm. the street, you could, you could hear it, people were listening to it. They, he had a huge audience, something mm -hmm. like 50%, I have mm -hmm. read, of people were listening mm -hmm. to him, because he was giving them not only a homily, he was giving them the news, mm -hmm. because he, they weren't getting the news from anybody else. <laughs> they weren't getting the scoop from the government. Mm -hmm. And so he would talk about what was happening in his country, in their neighborhoods, and they knew that he would be there for them for that. So uh, what would I say to the young leaders here? Uh, you know, you've got to have someone you look up to, right? You mean you, it's important to have that person to, to try to follow. For me, I started out in the, in the fifth grade. I had a nun who taught me, she must have been a very activist nun because she taught me about the evils of Papa Doc Duvalier in Haiti mm -hmm. and about Somoza in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, possessed by the devil they were, and they were. And so I always had that in my mind, in my head. It never kind of went away because she told some very vivid 
stories of, of the suffering of the people of both countries. And so that kind of kicked it off for me, my interest in the poor. And I grew up in a working class neighborhood, a lot of auto workers and, uh, and that. So I, I saw how hard people work and the need for them to deserve to have a break in life in terms of their compensation and their health and the wages and that. Uh, so it can make a difference to have someone you can look up to and, and you can model. And he's, as, you know, as I said, he's in the league with some of the really top people, right? Don't you think he's in the league with Nelson Mandela and Gandhi? And he's, he's, he's kind of right there. And Francis saw this very early on. Francis talked about, Pope Francis, about how he was uh, stoned with words by his opposition in El Salvador. And that opposition from even within the church. Mm -hmm. And he saw the difficulty that Romero had and, and how he overcame it. And uh, so I think, you know, it's easy to get discouraged, right? You look at the news, as Kim said, we're bombarded <laughs> with things and we're like, ay yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Mama mia, how can I get involved? How can I do anything? <laughs> And you just have to keep plugging at it. And there's a, there's a uh, words from Galatians. Uh, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not become weary. We cannot become weary. You have to stay in the battle, stay in the fight. And the fight is the journey. It's the journey. And you can make the journey holy. You can make the journey rewarding, you can make the journey a real part of your life. Mm -hmm. And if you have people like Romero to emulate, it's, it's easier to do. I think that's, that's, to me, the great lesson you take. I feel like Pope Francis often talks about uh, the gifts that young people have and talks about hope and tenacity and all the rest. And one of the, one of the gifts is, is almost a holy impatience, right? We want to get, we want to achieve justice. We want to have it done now. And I think one of the lessons we draw, as you say, is not to get us discouraged that it takes time. But the other thing that I noticed you said was, was how both Pope Francis and Archbishop Romero were dynamic. They were changing over time. They were listening and learning constantly. It's a journey. And I think that's such a great lesson for us all to take forward. I want to have some time for questions from you all. So I'm not, we have a mic in the back, um, but we'd love to have some questions from the audience. If anybody, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question of our panel, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Here we go. Here's a mic, just so we get it. Before I came here, I had no idea who uh, Father Romero was, to be honest with you. Uh, Salvadorian, uh, and uh, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, That's fine. <laughs> just talk into it so we get it. Okay, so I had no idea who our father were, but did he have any living family members at the time that, that may have survived him yeah. that, that were around yeah. after he, he, he became a martyr? Yes, yeah. he has. Oh. Yeah. Um, yes, he has a brother. A brother? Yeah, they have family in, uh, in El Salvador. Yeah. How, how did they react after after they uh, he was he's more did they care? Did, I, did guess they they in, the, uh, like, I guess they are in I guess they are in Rome as well. Uh, they are in Rome right now because they are going to participate on the on the oh, canonization. Okay. Yes, the, yes. The okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. Wouldn't that be fabulous, by the way, to be in Rome? Your have a family member. I'm trying to think of my family members being mm -hmm. seated. Go ahead. Hi. Um, Okay, um, so typically I, I believe when um, somebody becomes a saint, they have to perform a number of miracles. Mm -hmm. uh, what miracles ha has a Father uh, you want to explain that Monsignor Romero? Well, I, I, I've read, and all I know okay. is from what I read, and I read there was a uh, pancreatic cancer patient. That, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you know the details? Yeah. Maybe you but, would be better. But, at but he was kind of honest because of he was a martyr. That's the, in the first place. Uh huh. Okay, so but he has a miracle as well, the pancreatitis. And I think there was a cancer. wasn't there a pregnant woman who had a, who had an illness help that was mm -hmm. it's called right and and her husband uh, didn't even have a great devotion I think and he found a prayer card and and, and prayed to Archbishop Romero and miraculously uh, she recovered from the disease and lived. Um, so yeah, a couple miracles and then obviously yep. he's a martyr as mm -hmm. well and and so other questions, Kevin. This is probably for you, Mr. Bonnier. Uh, so the U.S. played this very important, well, nefarious role in, in the wars, right? And um, they were arming some of the, these groups that, and unfortunately there hasn't been justice still for 
Monsignor Romero's murder. What role does the, does the United States still have in this? I mean, there are still documents that haven't been turned over that are still classified that could point more clearly to who the perpetrators were. You know, what does this, uh, there's still justice that needs to be made in this case. And definitely more justice needs to be made, and it's a very good comment and question. Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that uh, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 billion at one point, $1.5 million a day from the U.S. government was going to the government in El Salvador who was responsible for a lot of most of these deaths. And they were also in uh, Roberto Dubesson, they were also in, in bed with the death squads the government was. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the Army officers were trained at the School of Americas, Fort Benning, Georgia. And we tried very hard to close that. And we're, they're still trying to, they've changed their name, they've done different things, but they had about a thousand officers that went down there and were trained. We trained their officers. And we trained at Fort Bragg in North Carolina about 500 of their infantry. So yes, we have much culpability it seems to me a lot of the violence that is now being perpetrated on the citizens of El Salvador by young uh, people who, uh, who grew up in this culture and who heard about this culture uh, is a direct result, I think, of, of, of that war. So there's reconciliation that needs to be done not only in Salvador but in Guatemala. And regretfully, what's happening in Nicaragua right now is, is it's horrific as well, and he needs to leave, Ortega. Yeah. So uh, there ought to be some compensation for the loss of those lives. I think we maybe have time for one more question. Go ahead. Um, hello, Carolina. Um, I'm also Salvadorian. Um, I was just wondering, Presidenta Peña, um, ¿cómo se prepara? How does El Salvador prepare for this? beautiful thing that's gonna happen this Sunday. I know it's gonna go crazy, yeah. pero como se prepara el Salvador? Um, well, I have a news from Roma that our embassy uh, of El Salvador in, 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 in the Vatican, they are uh, celebrating and, and hosting many Salvadorians that are over there. So they're going to have uh, like forums like this and presentations and, and I also have a news today about children of Tepecianos, we call it, from TPS holders. So those children went to the Vatican for the canonization of Monsignor Romero, but also meet with Pope Francis today or, or yesterday wow. an afternoon. And they ask the Pope to to intercede for them and, and, uh, and ask the United States to give them uh, residen uh, residencia permanente, permanent residence to the TPS holders. So this is a huge thing that the young people uh, uh, reach out because they went to the Pope and they speak out with them. So, so it's a very nice. So in El Salvador, there are going to be many parish that are going to present in the canonization online. So oh. at 2 a.m., I, I saw the page, the web page of my parish there. <laughs> <laughs> and they will be at 2 a.m. Uh, uh, projecting all the, all the canonization. So it's very, uh, as well in the, here in, in my consulate, we're going to have uh, the fourth festival of corn, uh, and we and Rutilio Grande used to do it in his parish, so it's a spread of the all the all the El Salvador the cities in El Salvador. So we're going to have the fourth uh, in honor to Monsignor Romero. That will be this Saturday, the 13th, at the Consulate of El Salvador in Silver Spring, Maryland. And also, the embassy of El Salvador is going to make the, the mass on the Sagrado Corazón, Sacred Heart um, Basilica, so it will be on 14. Um, I also bring to you these stamps, so you can have it, oh, one in the kitchen, because our magnets. 
<laughs> there are magnets. So uh, I, 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 I read some of the questions and say, how, how that Monsignor Romero impact you in your life, in your work? So I have Monsignor Romero everywhere. So um, I can give you one, if it's enough, I think it's enough, one of Monsignor Romero magnets for the canonization. <laughs> Sure. Uh, as well, uh, Washington is having a, a Te uh, at the National Shrine, 12 noon, mm -hmm. to celebrate also not only the canonization of uh, Archbishop Romero, but the canonization of, po of Pope uh, Paul VI. Paul and then, VI. then both of them are going to be in the Mass, and uh, I'm going to be the main celebrant for that Music Mass at 12 home. noon. And after that, there is a forum mm -hmm. at Catholic University about his life. Mm -hmm. Then everyone is welcome. And also following the invitation of Monsignor uh, Jameson, I would like, oh, Father Agustin is gone? He's gone. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Monsignor Jameson will continue to give you uh, some uh, invitations for different groups that uh, host young professionals here at the cathedral. That could be also very exciting news for all of you. Everyone is welcome. Thank Great. you. And here I'll give this right to you, Ralph. And I just want to say, um, first of all, I want to say thanks to two groups of people. And the first, I want to thank our panelists. We have a really wonderful example here of how to integrate faith and work, right? How do you integrate your faith and bring it to your life? Uh, Inez brought it to her public service, serving the, uh, the Salvadoran community here in DC and, and also serving the Salvadoran community in Boston and elsewhere. Um, David has brought his decades of public service working on issues of justice and peace, human rights. Uh, two wonderful examples here. Let's thank them for coming here tonight. And share. I also want to thank the people who made tonight possible. And first of all, it's Monsignor, I'm going to list them all and then we'll applaud at the end. It's Monsignor Jameson for providing this wonderful space for us and hosting us here at St. Matthew's. It's Bishop Dorsonville for having these wonderful comments uh, to introduce Archbishop Romero to us. It's my boss, John Carr, who has made this pro such an important uh, priority for the initiative on Catholic social thought and public life. And most of all, I'd like to give a special thanks to Javier as he's done so much to make this event happen tonight and so much for the Archdiocese of Washington on this issue. Thank you. Finally, one more plug. We want to make this, we want to renew this program. We want this to be a resource for you here in this room. We have sign-up sheets in the back. I hope you're going to get some more food and some more drinks. Sign-up sheets in the back. Put your name down. If you're interested in being part of our leadership group, just giving us some advice as to how to do this. We'll have these kind of events. Are there other things we should be doing that can help you all advance in your leadership in the Catholic community here? Please put a little asterisk by your name and I'll be sure to follow up with you. You can always reach out to me, kim.daniels at georgetown.edu. I really, really hope we see you at our Salt and Light programs, at our dialogues. Most of all, thank you for coming out here tonight. Thanks very much. <laughs>